If, uh, if you can remain standing while we read the Word of God this morning, it's interesting that we can read from Genesis 1, verse 1, all the way to Revelation 22, verse 21, the last verse in Scripture. They're all God-breathed, every, every one of them. So grateful that we have a fellowship that teaches and preaches the Word of God. And as we read through it this morning, I pray that we just, not just listen to the words, but partake in the words. As Pastor Matt, our pastor, will come up and share and, and glean from the Holy Spirit what these words mean for us this morning. So if you will, we're reading through John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. Now, therefore, the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put in it into the heart of Judas, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tried, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered, well, I am doing you, what I am doing to you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand, Peter said to him. You, will, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, 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 will, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on the outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should just do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is no greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. This is the word of the Lord. All right, good morning to you. And we are, we we're blessed. Yesterday, um, the tech team had a work day in the new space. There is a lot of stuff that is happening. And uh, for those of you that have helped, uh, we have people that have come to sweep during the week, uh, move some things, paint some things, build some things, cut some things, hang up some wires. So, uh, man, we are thankful, thankful for you and just uh, all your participation. And also realize that... Um, Next Sunday, uh, come dressed in uh, clothes so that as we have our worship gathering at the end of it, we are going to move everything out of here downstairs into the new space. Uh, remember, this new space, as we are uh, preparing it, it's not, it's not going to be complete. It's going to keep going. And also, it's important for us, you know, when we think about the tabernacle versus the temple, the tabernacle was this temporary space, Right? In the desert, the children of Israel would be in the, um, they would go through, and God gave Moses this design for a tabernacle, a place of worship. But then they would tear it all down when the cloud would move. So as God was moving them, then they would tear, I mean, imagine, how many of you are campers? You guys like to camp? 
Do you, do you love to look for that perfect campsite? And have you ever stayed at a campsite, like I have, where I only had it for two nights, but we wanted to stay for four nights? And what would happen is after the end of two nights, you have to pack it all up, go to another site that's not as good, or maybe it's a site that's better, but the packing up and moving is a hard thing. We, we want to realize that this place is a place of worship, um, but all places... Uh, in, in a way, are temporary. So we don't know how long we'll be there. Uh, we're, we're asking God for his hand upon us, and I think it's going to be exciting when you see it. So that's coming up. Also this week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, starting on Wednesday night at Mount Hermon, we are going to have the Pastors and Leaders Conference, uh, the Calvary Chapel Association. So if you're available on Tuesday night, it's too late to sign up to stay there. Uh, maybe it's too late for meals, but you might be able to come to the, the session on Wednesday night or Thursday night just to listen in, possibly. You could talk to Teresa about that. And then also, we are going to begin Explore God. So if you're listening online, uh, the message on Sunday morning is going to be, there's about 100 churches in the Bay Area. We're going through this together. We're examining the questions that people have about the Christian faith. What is the purpose of life? Why believe that there is a God? Why does God allow uh, injustice and suffering? Why does Christianity seem so narrow? Why believe that Jesus is God? How can I know the Bible is reliable? How can I know God personally? So these are the things we're going to be talking about on Sunday morning, but then in the homes, in our life groups, we are going to spend some time in hospitality around tables, uh, sharing meals at times, drinking coffee together, and talking about this. So if you know someone that's not a Christian, but they're curious and they have questions, invite them. And as the leaders in the homes are going to help people through these things in a gracious way, it's not to debate or put anyone on the spot. We're just going to present to them what we see in scripture. And that best happens around a meal or at a table. Um, you'll have an opportunity during the message to text in questions. I won't always get them today, but I might get them during the week. But the best place to discuss them really is at a table. And I'm going to pray in a moment, but this is the setting actually of the passage we're in today in John chapter 13. So John chapter 13, what do you know this painting as? The Last Supper. Uh, who painted that? Leonardo da Vinci. Um, was he there? No. All right. So this is a lot of times we picture this in our head. This is this last supper and we see Jesus there in the middle and all the disciples around him. It probably looked more like this. Uh, it's called a triclinium. That's kind of like a, a formal dining table. They would recline. Uh, one time there was a, a Japanese food place that uh, Deanna and I brought some friends to. And uh, they put us in this special room, and it's low. It's a low table. There's pillows. You kind of sit, and it's kind of interesting. You're kind of kneeling. You're on your side, and you know you have your elbow there on the table, and, and there's pillows that are all, all around you. So um, anyway, that, do I have that? There we go, the triclinium there. So um, I'm going to pray, and then we are going to get into John chapter 13 this morning. So uh, let's pray. Father, this morning, we want to thank you that you teach us. We want to thank you, Lord, that you desire to meet with us. So when we gather as your people, for those that are at home or listening in cars or on phones later on, I pray that you would give them a still heart. It's difficult sometimes for us in our world to just quiet our thoughts enough to hear from you. God, our attention spans, we admit, are trained by TikTok and YouTube and tweets and, and very short um, dialogue. And yet, God, we know that there are times that you want to speak to us in that still small voice and you want to teach us. And so we pray that by your Holy Spirit that you would help us to be present. God, whether we are here or whether we are listening um, online, God, meet with us. Lord, still our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, the message is identity, love, and power. There's so much in this passage that I believe not only speaks to us as individuals, but really speaks to where we are as a nation, where we are as a church, where we are as a community. So 
The outline this morning, identity, love, and power. If you have your John workbook, you could take notes right in there. Um, if you don't, we have some available for you, and you could get one, and we're just going through the book of John. Uh, first, it's the full extent of his love. There's ultimate power, living out of his identity, love, power, and identity in action. Then we're going to see Peter's reaction and the example of Jesus. So this morning, I want to begin with the full extent of his love. And let's read what it says in John chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So Jesus, all throughout the gospel, says, my hour has not yet come. They want to make him king. They want to set him up to start worshiping him as as king, which is his rightful place. But he's like, hey, it's not my hour yet. He knows that as soon as that happens, that those that worship Caesar and the Roman government would see that as an act of treason, as an act of rebellion. He also knows that there's going to be a time that he's going to be betrayed. And so all of this is in God's timing. And now he knows that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father. And then it says that he, having loved them who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So he loved his own. Who are his own? Does that mean that God loved the Jews and he didn't love the Gentiles? Does that mean that God loves you as a Christian and he doesn't love people that aren't Christians? No. We look in scripture, we see, for God so loved the world. But he's going out of the world, but he's loving his own in this special way. In other words, you could love other people, but there are people that are your family or your friends that they have the the opportunity to receive a deeper love and a deeper relationship. Jesus loved the whole world, but he loved those who were his own in a way that specifically to them, because they had received him, they were going to be able to see what this love looked like all the way until the end. The word love them to the end could also be the full extent of his love. I want you to think about what does it look like to love someone to the full extent of your love. Now we could could say, well, the full extent of your love I know at Christmas time, there's that really cool commercial. Uh, it's all white because there's snow coming down. And then a black Lexus is in the driveway with a bow on top of it, right? And like that's the full extent of your love. Or um, show her with a diamond. And the diamond is the full extent. That, that's the way we think of the full extent of our love. But we're going to see in Jesus' example that When we consider love, if you were with us on Wednesday evenings when we went through 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the word love is the most overused word in the English language because we use this such powerful word that when a relationship grows and the first time, for example, the first time that I told Deanna, I love you, I knew that that carried some weight. I knew that that really meant something. But in the next sentence, I could say, man, I really love the Lakers. You know, like, and she could say, well, like, huh, like you just said that you love me and then you you love the Lakers. And then like, is that what it, is that, does that equate? Uh, We could say, man, I I love double doubles, you know, animal style grilled onions. I love in and out. Um, And I I love it when um, I'm in traffic and my lane flows faster than everyone else's lane. I I love that. So we have this word, but agape love is this love that is shown where Jesus later on is going to say this, greater love has no one than this, than that he lays down his life for his friend. There's a sacrificial love. In fact, when it comes to understanding that sacrificial love. Um, I have a friend that I, I think I shared last Sunday. He's really struggling. He's, he's a Christian. He's been a Christian. We've known each other for decades since college. And, and he's struggling right now because he is, he's just seen some Christians just act really badly in the last few years. And he's starting to become disillusioned with this whole thing. And then he's you know, when you watch a video, you realize that you're going to get more videos that are like the video that you just watched. 
And so if you watch a video of someone that says the gospel is the worst thing in the world, that, that you don't even count, you don't even matter. In fact, when God looks at you, he doesn't even see you. He only sees Jesus, the sacrifice. So you're, you could be, you're, you're just like dust. You don't even matter in this world. You're like nothing. And, and this ex-pastor was saying these things, and he said, the gospel, it just seems like bad news to me. And so my friend had sent me this video, and what I shared with him, I said, the gospel, I th- said, I think this pastor misunderstood this part of it. The gospel makes us realize that, yes, we are sinners that fall short of God's glory. We have broken relationship. We have broken trust. Uh, we have gone our own way. But yet the gospel also makes us realize that we're more loved than we could ever hope for. Who else is willing to die and sacrifice for you? So when Jesus shows the full extent of his love, we're going to see it not only in this last week, not only in this last supper headed towards the cross, but in his actions towards them when they are together at this meal. But not only does he show them the full extent of his love, he also displays this ultimate power. In verses 2 and 3, so John 13, verses 2 and 3, notice, during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. This is like um, Deanna predicts movies and TV shows better than anyone I have ever met. In fact, the other night, it was funny, we were watching an episode of FBI, and we were in like the first, I would say, 60 seconds of the show, and in the first 60 seconds, she just says, oh, this is this, and you know, this person gets killed, and this is why, and and I said, well, we don't have to watch this, and I just changed the channel, and she looked at me, and she's like, what what are you doing? I'm like, well, we don't have to watch it anymore. You just told me everything that's going to happen, and so like, you kind of predicted it. And then I was, I'm just kidding. Okay, we'll watch it. And of course, what is it? It's, it's exactly what she says. You know, we, that's exactly what happened. When, when I look at verses two and three, if, if I were a director, if I were a storyteller, this sets it up. Judas is this villain. The devil has already put it into his heart. And Judas hasn't betrayed Jesus yet. I, I want to give a teaching point that sometimes the temptation comes. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot. Maybe there's a thought that you are mulling over right now, a temptation um, to go your own way, to do your own thing. You don't have to act on that. You don't have to. The thought does not equate to having to act. That, that's the thing that, in fact, when people struggle with addiction, the, the thing they struggle with is I have to, I don't have any choice. It's like whether it's, Um, a drug or it's food or it's gossip or it's shopping or it's pornography. It's like once the thought is in there, now I have to do it. No, we don't. There's something that we could do with that thought. There's something that we could do with that intent. But Judas is set up as this villain and then Jesus knows that the father had given all things into his hands. Now here's the power. All things, all power is in Jesus's hands. Um. For me, this would be the baseball scene uh, in, in uh, The Untouchables where, uh, you know, you, you have, uh, uh, what's his name? De Niro. De Niro is playing Al Capone, and he has a bat, and he's walking around saying baseball's a team sport. It's a team sport, and they're all sitting at the table, and you know the guy who's betrayed him, and you know what's going to happen to that guy because, the, you know, Al Capone has this baseball bat. This is the part where... The devil had already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, and then Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, to me, in my fallen nature, this is the part where I'm sitting there if I'm Jesus, and Judas all of a sudden starts choking on his food or something, you know, like, what's going on? I'm choking, and then Jesus looks at him like he knows that he was going to betray him, right? That's not what Jesus does with his power. In fact, when you think about all power, all things had been given in, into his hand. What quote do you know about all power? Absolute power. What is the quote? Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. 
There's a guy that said that. His name is Lord Acton. He said, I cannot accept your canon. That means like your rule that we are to judge Pope and King unlike other men with a favorable presumption that they do no wrong. Um, my mom used to have kind of this thing where if I would criticize a president, it did not matter what president it was. It doesn't matter if it was Democrat or Republican or good president or bad. Matthew, don't say that. He's the president. I'm like, I know, but the president is not infallible, mom. He's not Jesus. Look at, look at all these things the president has done. And, and Lord Acton said, we, we're not supposed to judge Pope and King as though everything they, that we presume, they don't do any wrong. He said, if there's any presumption, it's the other way against holders of power. We, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Lord Acton took this the opposite. Not do you give them a pass as though everything they say is good and right, but almost like everything they say is probably tainted with some kind of wrong and some kind of evil. We see that in our world today when you see this power struggle with critical theory, the haves, the haves not, the oppressed, the oppressor, rich versus poor, um, you know, like you're from this nation or this nation, you're either good or bad. And, and I just, I, I think that there's some problem with understanding that all power, now I think that if he would have just left it that power tends to corrupt, I would say that that's true. It tends to corrupt. And, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's where I would have to say Jesus has absolute power. And so Lord Acton, anyone that calls him, is himself Lord, probably is the person that has to have that finger pointing back at him, right? I just say this as Lord Acton. Um, I want to show you an example of what I mean by power does not always corrupt. This is a friend of mine. His name is Joe Ross Marino. Joe was a gunnery sergeant in the U.S. Marines during the Korean War. Um, great sergeant. Put in charge of battalions. Put in the front of battles. Um, had a military career. Retired from the U.S. Marines with full retirement. Uh, he and his wife were living down in Southern California in the San Diego area. His wife uh, was a manager of a bakery at Safeway. Uh, basically, he was a retired military instructor, and then he would also do some instruction at the bases. Um, by all means, he had power. He had physical power. He was strong. He had retirement. He lived in the United States. You don't realize this. If you live in the United States, you're wealthy compared to most of the world, the, the great majority of the world. If you have a refrigerator and a flush toilet and a car, you're very wealthy compared to much of the world. So according to Lord Acton, according to this power corrupts, um, at times we would see this person as like, well, he has power. He, he would be in our world today what they would, um, some people would say he has privilege. And in his privilege, because of his ethnicity and because of his money and because of his background, he's He's evil because he has this power, and, and you can't trust him. But what he did with his power is he and his wife were on a mission trip with their church to the Philippines, and they felt like God maybe was calling them. He felt this way as he was leaving. He said, I saw the Filipino people when I was in the Marines, and I just love these people, and my heart is knit to them. So they went on a mission trip because their church went on this mission trip, and he did not tell his wife on the plane back. He was afraid to talk to her to say, I think God is calling us to sell our house in San Diego and move to the Philippines and plant a church. She didn't want to tell him, I feel like God might be telling us to sell our house, to move to the Philippines and to plant a church. They got home, they talked about it, and he said, you know what, there's something that I, I just want to tell you. As he brought it up, she felt the same thing. They ended up moving there with their two children um, at elementary school age. Their kids were very young. Start, they planted a church, and as they planted a church, um, the, they, they started to become very trusted by the people in their city in Bacolod. And as they started to become trusted, uh, the, the city officials came to him one day, and his wife, Joe, and his wife's name is Billy Joe, and they said, 
there is a little girl that has been abused and um, she has no home. Her, her dad was trying to sell her. And this goes all the way back to probably the 1980s, late 80s, early. Um, her dad is trying to sell her. We cannot find a home for her, but we trust you. Would you be willing to take her in? And they came home and they prayed, they thought about it. They're like, we, we had no intention of adopting, but how can we say no? Because we have the means I'm, re- I'm receiving a military income, you know, we're planting, okay, we'll take her in. They took her in, talked to their kids, hey, you're going to get a sister, and the sister's there. A couple of days later, the same city official knocked at the door and said, she has a brother. We didn't want to tell you. She has a brother, and they need to be united. Would you be willing to adopt the brother also? And they really struggled, okay, oh, wow, she has a brother, should we? They took in the brother. They said, she has another brother. (laughs) Would you be willing? So they go from a family of four to five to six, and then another brother to a family of seven. Joe and Billy Ross Marino ended up just living in the Philippines, and now they have over 180 children. They take children that have severe physical handicaps. Um, They were one of the only places in that whole region to build a swimming pool for physical therapy for kids that need it. Uh, This little boy, Matthew, when Deanna and I went, man, it was such a a heavy time. They had just received Matthew because Matthew was left at their doorstep. He had no hands and no feet and no tongue. And they said he probably won't survive long because he can't really suck. And we're not sure if he's going to live. And they said, we'll take him. And uh, Deanna at our pastor's conference in Dumaguete, she held little Matthew and she looked at him, and then I went back years later, and little Matthew was playing around with all of these other kids when he's eight years old, and then later on, like 12 years old, and you see these things, and what I realize is that God has given Joe Ross Marino and his wife, Billy Joe, some power, and they use that power for good to affect people that were less fortunate that they could help. I'm really, really thankful that there are good people with some power. Because good people with some power can do some really good things. And that's why it's important when we hear this power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yes, power tends to corrupt, but that's why we need to steward the power that we have, which we all have it. You don't realize it, the power of your words, the power of finances, the power of your giftings, and to steward those things as servants of God. To say, God, now you've given me this ability, you've given me these resources You've given me some finances. You've given me some giftings. Now, how can I use these giftings to help others? So Jesus gives us this example. He lives out of his identity. Now, when it comes out to living out your identity, it's hard today. It is hard to find your identity in the world that we live in. People find their identity in their sexuality that's who I am. And, and I'm not picking on any group. I'm just saying this. Do you know people who are, are heterosexual and are in a, a marriage that are depressed? Absolutely. Do you know people that are homosexual that are in a relationship that are depressed? Absolutely. Do you know single people who are depressed and feel like I, I'm overwhelmed. I have this anxiety. Yes. If I'm looking for my identity and my sexuality, I'm looking at too low of a plane to find my purpose and my meaning. If I look at ethnicity, are there people from every ethnicity that are depressed? Some people that are angry, some people that are mean, some people that are evil. Yes. Are there some wealthy people that are mean and evil? Are there some poor people that are mean and evil? So when we look for our identity in a world that says, look for your identity in something else, we miss it and it causes more confusion and it causes more division. So Jesus lives out his identity with absolute power and the full extent of his love coming together in his identity. Notice what it says at the end of verse three, Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands 
and that he had come from God and was going back to God. He knew who he was. Jesus lived out his identity. He knew his hour had come. He understood his purpose and his time. Sometimes when we think about timing, there are seasons in a person's life that if we try to take on too much in a season that we're not ready for it, we destroy ourselves. Sometimes if we try to take on too much when we're at a season when we should not be taking those extra things on, then we destroy relationships and we destroy our margin and we destroy our peace. Jesus knew his hour had come. He knew who he was. He knew where he was from and he knew where he was going. It's a great example of someone who lives out his identity. In fact, how do we find our identity when the world says, okay, you're a, you're a man, you're a man. Live out your identity as a man. Not as popular anymore, but if you remember like in the 80s and 90s, there was a popular cigarette that had an advertisement of a man. He was a cowboy. And what was he called? The Marlboro Man, right? And that's like, oh, that's, that's a man. We, we look at today when it comes to uh, what is a woman, there's so much confusion. What is a woman? Where do I find my identity? What is a woman? Is there a such thing as a woman? And if so, what does that mean? Does it mean that uh, uh, you have to like um, romantic movies? Does it mean that, oh, you're supposed to be strong and more powerful than the men? Like, we, we live out in this difficult place where people are looking for identity and they are struggling to find it. And what happens is that identity, when they find it in something other than Christ and our identity in being beloved of God, created in his image to do good works, I'll tell you, we start vilifying other people and our pride takes us above others to look down on them or we start beating ourselves up and look down on ourselves and think everyone else has it better than I do. Jesus knows who he, he is. He knows where he's from, where he's going and his hour had come. And, and notice that one of the reasons why he knew that is he understood his relationship with the Father. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, I love this. Remember that up to this point in the gospel of Matthew, up to the point when Jesus is about 30 years old, what do we know about him? What are some things we know about Jesus? He was a carpenter's son. What else do we know? Okay, born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth. He has siblings. There's not a lot that we know. We, we know from other scriptures, but there's not a lot mentioned about his first 30 years of his life, correct? His public ministry had not started yet as far as everyone knowing who he is and his purpose and why he had come. But I want you to notice what happens here. When Jesus was baptized, he went up from the water. Behold, the heavens were open to him. He saw the spirit of God so we see the Trinity at work here, the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And a voice from heaven, from the Father, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. It is so important that we find our identity in understanding who we are and we take the example of Jesus in his humanity. First of all, this is my beloved Son. You are loved by God, you belong to God, with whom I am well pleased. And when we follow Jesus and in his grace, realize that our sin, yes, part of the gospel is that he, the Father looks on Jesus, but another part of it is he sees you, and he forgives you, and he loves you. If you are a parent, this is so important for us as parents that our kids know these things. It's going to help their identity. I'm not saying it's going to solve all their problems, but it's going to help their identity. You are my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter. First of all, I love you. Second of all, you belong to me. Thirdly, in whom I am well pleased, I'm proud of you. It doesn't mean you're proud of everything, every part, everything that they do, but our kids need to know that they belong. They need to know that they're loved. They need to know that that pleasing comes to the heart of a good mother or father. When we see Jesus' example, and he understands this, 
this is before Jesus has publicly healed anyone. This is before Jesus starts his public ministry of teaching. This is before he, quote unquote, does the stuff. Before he does the stuff, he's received, he's known, he's loved. The father is able to say to him and he's able to receive, this is, you belong to me, you're my son, I love you, I'm well pleased. Knowing your identity in Christ reminds you that you are known, loved, and accepted. Man, we need this today. In a world of anxiety, in a world of rejection, in a cancel culture, we absolutely need to know our identity in Christ. When you feel like in a room full of people that nobody knows you, realize that God knows you. When you feel like in a room full of people that say they love you and you feel unloved, know that God loves you. And the amazing thing about the gospel, which that pastor that I talked about earlier misunderstood, God knows all of my sin and loves me anyway. Who else does that? There's secrets that you might keep because you're afraid if people know, then they would reject you. But God already knows. So just a little word of advice, if there are things that you're keeping from God, you don't have to do that, okay? Because he already knows. And I am accepted in the beloved. I am accepted in Christ. And know this, even before I came to him, he was reaching out to me. I haven't done, we haven't done the stuff to earn it. For all have fallen short, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He doesn't love us because, man, look at my track record, all these things that I've done. He loves us anyway. In fact, knowing our identity in Christ not only reminds us that we are known, loved, and accepted, but listen to this. This, this is a gem that I got uh, from a, a guy named Bob Hyatt. Knowing my identity in Christ enables me to know who I am and what I am about irrespective of what you think I am and what I'm about. Okay, I'm going to repeat that. Knowing my identity in Christ enables me to know who I am and what I'm about, irrespective of what I think you think I am and what I'm about. Because otherwise, we're living for the approval of other people. And in the cancel culture in which we are in, don't you see politicians and athletes and singers and actors just walking on eggshells, so afraid that if they say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, they're going to be canceled? Checking their Twitter feed, checking their social media to make sure that they still have this fan base, that people are still holding them up in this way. And it's not just famous people. This is us when we live in a way to please other people. And we're so worried about what other people are thinking. You know what? God knows that I'm worse than you think I am. You know what else? I am more beloved and God loves me more than you could ever love me. And when we realize that, it gives us this sense of security. It prepares us for the praise of people. Sometimes the praise of people puffs, up, puffs, up, puffs us up where we start living on that praise. And sometimes the criticism of other people beats us up and we just feel like we're in a hole because of the criticism and the, the way that people come against us. But knowing who I am in Christ enables me to be secure you know what else it prepares me for? Not only for criticism and praise, it prepares me for pain. Because when life is very difficult and I know who I am in Christ and I know that God loves me, I no longer judge God's love for me and my standing with him based on what kind of a Monday I'm having, based on what kind of a week I'm having because he's already demonstrated his love. Jesus brings it all together in verses four and five, love, power, and identity in action. Notice what he does. What does Jesus do now? He's gonna show them the full extent of his love. He has this, all things are in his hand, all this power. What does he do with that power? I, I love Gil Irwin. He, he talked about like, uh, he saw the, this, he, he was at Venice Beach and all these bodybuilders, right? There's all these muscle guys that are there. And uh, there's this one guy, he's just like, you know, flexing, doing all these things. And he walks up to the guy and he goes, wow, you could lift a lot of weight. And the guy goes, yeah, I can. He said, what do you do with it? <laughs> and he goes, well, watch this. You know, and he like does this pose and he goes, 
but all that power, what do you do with it? Like, what do you do with that power? He goes, well, watch this. And he does another pose and like, he has all this power, but what does he do with it? And I think about what does Jesus do with his power? Because I would expect him to do the Darth Vader thing with Judas and just like lift him up, you know, and like choke him. I, I would expect him, you know, like when he is coming through in the triumphal entry and Hosanna in the highest and everyone that comes to arrest him, they just like get blown far back like in a Marvel movie and they just go flying into space. I, I, what does Jesus do with his power? What does he do with his love? What does he do with this identity knowing who he is, the son of God, the king of kings, in action, this is what brings it all together when Jesus says, or it says about Jesus in verse four, Jesus rose from supper and laid aside his outer garments. So he takes off his cloak and then he takes a towel and he ties it around his waist. And I want you to notice the words, he laid aside his outer garments. I think there's some symbolism there because Jesus did not take off his deity when he came to earth in the incarnation, but what he took on was humanity. We could look at it from our point of view as taking off his outer garment. In fact, remember at the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus is there with Peter, James, and John, and he transforms and he's this brilliant light and just so bright, they can't handle how incredible that is. It's like right now, Jesus in his humanity has taken on some human skin but he lays aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. As Jesus is doing this, I can't help but imagine this scene in my head. Uh, I've told you before that I was a part of a foot washing thing in college. Very uncomfortable very awkward. Um, they can be beautiful and they could be great, those, those ceremonies like that. I hated it. I just, my, my friend said, okay, we're, we, he taught on John 13. And then he said, we're going to do this. And he brings out this basin. I'm, I'm like, no way. Like you ain't, you ain't touching my feet. There's not, not a chance. And yet he's like, well, that's kind of like Peter's response. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give you this kind of what Peter was feeling. And so like we did that and it was very strange. Um, that was with socks and shoes, okay, in modern world. You ever go camping and someone's wearing sandals and their feet are sweating and all the dirt gets caked on underneath their foot and their sandal and it causes this film, this kind of like layer of crust that's there. They're laying down, they're, they're eating, probably in one of those Roman tables, they're kind of kneeling against it. And man, Peter, your foot is right next, your foot is touching my leg, Peter. I just sock him in the chest, like, <laughs> get away from me, right? And Jesus actually gets down and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. There's something else that I think of. I think of what did they smell, okay? Now I think about the smell of the feet, right? Bad, bad smell. Some people have really, really bad feet. And I'm sorry, but you do. Some people have really, really bad feet. Um, I think they smelled something else. I think they also smelled the fragrance of what happened just before this when Mary took that very costly jar of spikenard, that, that special ointment, and anointed Jesus' feet. And, and that scent of that oil probably wafted into all of them. She washed his feet with her hair. Jesus is, this is a second foot washing in, in just a couple of days. And he does this same thing. And maybe they could have gone to the place where say, okay, that was weird when she did that. That was not, that was like off the wall, like she was embarrassing. But okay, we get it because you're Jesus. But now Jesus is doing it for them. And they just took them down to another humble level. You ever feel humbled? and you feel like the ground is here, and you wish you can get below the ground because you just feel so humbled by it. And, and I think that this is happening. I think of Peter's reaction here in verses six and seven. Peter, it says, um, he came to Simon Peter. Jesus came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what I'm doing, you do not understand now, but afterward, you will understand. Peter, I know you don't get this right now. You're, you're gonna understand later. 
Sometimes God does things in our lives that we do not understand right now. Too often, we only think of that, I don't, under, I don't get it, I don't understand, when we're going through bad things, right? So you have a flat tire, and you're on your way to a job interview, you get out there, your tire's flat, you're stressed, you start to sweat, you realize I'm not going to make the job interview, you say, why God, why? Doesn't make sense, why? Maybe he didn't want you to have that job. Maybe he knew that that job would destroy you. There are so many things that God protects us from that we don't even know. But you know the why me that really blows me away is when I think about how blessed I am and I just go, God, why me? Like, why, why me? Like, I look at the church that we have. I look at the, my family. I look at God's blessings in my life and I'm like, God, why? Why me? Why do, like, I, I don't get it. I think that Peter's going to understand, he, he, Peter feels like, why would Jesus wash my feet? There's some things that you don't understand, and later you will. Uh, uh, Rigo and I were listening to a podcast yesterday, and uh, there was a guy who, um, his, his, his wife committed suicide, and he was on this podcast, and he was saying his struggles with the why God. He, he didn't understand. He still doesn't understand, and in his mind, he thought, God should answer all of my prayers the way that I would answer my own prayers. Because it's a reasonable thing. I'm not asking something that is outlandish. I'm not asking something that is selfish. It's a reasonable thing. And he heard Tim Keller teach on this one time, and Tim Keller said, God would answer all of your prayers exactly as you would expect God to answer all of your prayers if you knew everything that God knew. If you understood everything that God understood, there's some things that we don't understand right now. In verses eight and nine, Peter said to him, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus said to him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. This is speaking of this cleansing that happens in, in becoming a follower, a disciple of Christ. It's, it's what happens in a regenerated person. It's what happens when we ask for forgiveness we follow Jesus, but daily, Simon Peter said, Lord, not my feet only then, but my hands and my head. But then notice in verse 10, Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. If I have received Christ into my life, I don't have to re-receive him into my life. I am cleansed by the washing of regeneration in, in Titus chapter three. I'm cleansed, I'm, I'm born again, I'm a follower of Christ. And you are clean, and he says, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. And that's why he said, not all of you are clean. Next week, we are going to spend some time really looking more at Judas. Maybe you have some betrayal in your life. But Jesus says, hey, if you're bathed, you don't need to be washed except for your feet. You know, I think that when it comes to the daily stuff that we step in, the daily stuff that we step in, we need, to be, we need to have our feet clean daily. I need to come back to him. God, I stepped into a mess today. God, I got in this argument. God, I lusted. God, I had greed. God, I had pride. God, I gossiped. God, God I, I knew you were calling me to help this person. I just didn't want to. God, I was lazy. God, I was self-centered. God, would you clean me up? I don't have to re-accept the Lord tomorrow. But I'll tell you what I need is if in relationship with him, if I want to continue in that fellowship, I need to have my feet cleaned daily. If I don't have my feet cleaned daily, you know what could easily happen? I could just get used to dirty feet. And I could just start to live with dirty feet as though this is just who I am. I'm a dirty foot guy. And um, yeah, I know. I'm just, that's, and, and dirty feet guys and gals, can sometimes begin to doubt that God even loves us. We can begin to doubt that we belong to him. We could d doubt that our relationship with him is real because instead of that daily foot washing, we just let it build up and we're just like, this is who I am. Many times a person's deconstruction of faith comes from giving in to sin on a daily basis and then just living in it and the doubts begin to build. If you're in that place, Today, you're going to have an opportunity for Jesus to wash your feet. And like Peter, you're going to feel at times like, not me, I'm not good enough. And Jesus is saying, hey, if 
I don't wash your feet, like we can't have this re- fellowship, this relationship. So Jesus' example, verses 12 and, and on, it says, when he had washed their feet, he put on his outer garment and resumed his place. And he said to them, so we're gonna look next week at Jesus being the host. He resumed his place as the host. He said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? Because Peter didn't understand. And he said, do you understand? And he said, you call me teacher and Lord and you are right for so I am. You know what I love about this? Jesus isn't identifying as teacher and Lord. He is teacher and Lord. You know, people say, well, I just, um, you know, I'm Filipino, but I identify as a six foot four uh, point guard in the NBA. Like I'm, I'm, I, that's who I, and I could identify as that, but that's not me. Jesus says, you call me teacher and Lord. He identifies as teacher and Lord and you're right for so I am. I really am that. It's who I am in reality. If I then, your Lord and teacher, and by the way, teacher and Lord, is he your teacher and your Lord? Because some people say, well, I like his teachings, but he's not Lord of my life. I like Jesus. I like the Sermon on the Mount. There's some good stuff in there. And I like to quote half of those verses out of context when it suits me. (laughs) He's a great teacher. Um, But Lord, and Jesus says, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, Man, when it is hard to wash someone else's feet, I am absolutely positive nobody wanted to wash one another's feet around that table. No one wanted to be the low man on the totem pole. No one wanted to give up seat or position or standing. And Jesus says, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Who's there? just a bunch of guys that are about ready to forsake him at his worst time, at his moment of need? Who's there? Just a guy who has been fooling everyone else, but Jesus knows his heart, and he's going to betray him. Satan already put that into his heart to betray him, and Jesus is there washing his feet. For I have given you an example. No, Jesus is always the example, but there are only a couple of times when Jesus says, I have given you an example, and this is one of them. I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Christians, sometimes Jesus has called you to be the messenger, and you're afraid of being the messenger because you don't want people not to like you. We're not greater than him. We need to be faithful messengers to proclaim what it is that he's told us to proclaim with grace and truth. And then he says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. The Christian faith, the relationship with God following Jesus is not just a cerebral thing. It's not knowing all of the right stuff. Often we think of discipleship as we meet at a coffee shop and we have coffee and we learn the four spiritual laws or we learn, uh, you know, the Sermon on the Mount. We learn principles and principles are a part of it. But being a follower of Jesus, Jesus is not just a bunch of head knowledge. It's not just a mental assent that says, I agree to these things. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So as we come to a time of communion, a time of remembering his sacrifice, we're going to do it in a special way today. Um, As the worship team comes up and begins to lead us in, in music, we are first of all going to consider John chapter 13 verses 1 through 17 in the communion ceremony that Jesus gave to us at this Last Supper. So when we think about it, um, by the way, the, the, the cups are beneath your chairs or behind the one in front of you. If you're in the front row, then they're under your chairs. Hold on to them. We're going to partake together at the end, so don't, don't partake yet. Communion is remembering Jesus' sacrifice and what he's done. When we take the bread, we're going to remember his body that was given, beaten for us, the things he went through, the, the struggles. When we take the cup, we're going to remember the, 
the blood that was shed on our behalf. But remember this, Jesus also, in this last supper, he washed other people's feet. Um, he loved others to the full extent of his love, even people that were going to forsake him and betray him. And he understood exactly who he was. When we partake of communion today, the full extent of his love, we're going to see it in the cross. This morning, where do you find your identity? Do you find it in, hey, I, I am a blank, whatever your occupation is. I'm an artist, I'm a construction worker, I'm a banker, I'm an architect, I'm a manager, I'm whatever, a teacher. Is that my identity? Because if that's my identity, what happens when I lose that job? What happens when I can no longer function in the role and position that I used to have? What happens when I retire, when I get laid off, when I get transferred? All of a sudden, my identity is crushed. But when I find my identity in the cross, in Jesus and what he's done, I realize I am absolutely loved as I am. As we consider the full extent of his love in the cross this morning, am I willing to give up control and to trust his power? Am I willing to give up control and to trust his power? Peter is like, no, you're, you're not going to wash my feet. I'm not going to let you do that. Um, I need to be in control of these things and, and, and feel like I've earned it. Am I going to give up control, even of situations that are beyond me? Remember, Jesus said, you don't understand this now, but later you will. What situation are you in today that maybe you don't understand and your fear is causing you to try to control the situation? The cross can remind you that Jesus said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. What about asking Christ to give you a clean start? Remember, Jesus said, the person that has bathed doesn't need to be um, cleaned again, only his feet washed. But maybe you've never been bathed by Christ. You've never been cleansed. You've never been born again. You have never been regenerated. And what that means is you've never asked Jesus to come in to forgive you of your sin, to trust what he has done on the cross, to die for your sin, to be enough to pay that penalty of your shame. See, we all live with guilt and shame. The cross gives us a way to deal with guilt and shame, not by saying I need perfection or I need to deny that I even sinned in the first place, but I can come saying, hey, I blew it, but God, thank you for what you've done. Would you forgive me and come into my life? Maybe you just need to let Jesus wash your feet. You've had a, a streak of bad days and you are starting to live as a dirty foot person and you've gotten used to it and that's just who I am. And Jesus says, would you let me come in? Let me clean you. Let me wash your feet. Because I'm willing to do it, but, but you gotta w be willing to let me because that's what relationship is about. That's what trusting me is about. And finally, before we partake of communion together, there might be someone that you are holding just bitterness and vindictiveness and hurt. And I'm not saying that by forgiving, you let go of what happened. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. You still might, may have been traumatized by what someone else did. But the bitterness that you may be holding is it, I've heard it this way before. That's like drinking poison and expecting that other person to feel it. And you're holding on to this poison of bitterness and Jesus is saying, would you let it go? Very practical thing that happened to me when I was in college. Uh, John Wallace, who was the uh, dean at the time, he had us, um, right before communion, he said something, we're gonna do something different. We're gonna... We're going to respond in communion, but before we do that, we're going to hand out these moist towelettes. And I'm going to ask you symbolically to wash your neighbor's hand and just to wash their hands and just remember what Christ has done for you. And when you have someone else do that for you, as humbling as that is, remember that Jesus wants to do this for you. But if there's someone in this auditorium, he said, that has hurt you and you have been carrying this hurt with you, 
then I want to challenge you to let go of that because it's hindering you. And I want you to go to that person and I want you to wash that person's hand. Sitting in that auditorium was um, someone that had really hurt me and I was holding on to it. It was really hard. And I prayed, I had my head down and I said, my first words were, no way, no way. And then as I was praying, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, well, you're gonna be hindered still if you don't do it. My arguing with God went like this. There's thousands of people in this room. I wouldn't be able to find that person anyway if I wanted to. And as I prayed, I looked up and all the way across on the other side of the gym, I caught eye contact with this person dying inside. I got up and I walked over to this person. Uh, this person put out her hands and I washed her hands. And as I washed her hands, I didn't say a word. I walked back to my seat. I went to class afterwards, just felt like a wreck. I put my head on my desk and I was just, God, why did you make me do that? Like that was embarrassing. It was humiliating. And I look up on the board, and our professor had written a verse on the board for the day. It said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, now you're free. Now you're free. And I was. God wants to free you today. When we partake of communion today, there's a, a spiritual, supernatural thing that's going to happen in your heart when you find your identity in Christ, when you give up control and you trust His power when you ask him to give you a clean start because of what he's done for you, when you let him wash your feet and you say, God, help me to wash the feet of others. And I know it's hard, but I'm willing to let you do it through me because I can't. I'm willing to let you do it through me because I can't. There's freedom. So we're gonna sing this song. We're gonna pray together. And after we sing this song, we are going to partake of the elements. So hold on to them. Let's sing and then we are going to partake together as a body of Christ. And if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you could do that right now by just praying, Jesus, forgive me. Come into my life. I trust you. Thank you for dying for my sin and fill me. So let's worship.